A Cynic Looks at Life by Ambrose Bierce. Section 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Cynic Looks at Life by Ambrose Bierce. The Gift O Gab. A book entitled Forensic Eloquence by Mr. John Goss appears to have for purpose to teach the young idea how to spout, and that purpose, I dare say, it will accomplish if something is not done to prevent. I know nothing of the matter myself. A strong distaste for forensic eloquence, or eloquence of any kind, implying a man mounted on his legs and doing all the talking, having averted me from its study. The training of the youth of this country to utterance of themselves after that fashion, I should regard as a disaster of magnitude. So far as I know it, forensic eloquence is the art of saying things in such a way as to make them pass for more than they are worth. Employed in matters of importance, and for other employment it were hardly worth acquiring, it is mischievous because dishonest and misleading. In the public service, truth toils best when not clad in cloth of gold and bedaubed with fine lace. If eloquence does not beget action, it is valueless. But action which results from the passions, sentiments, and emotions is less likely to be wise than that which comes of a persuaded judgment. For that reason, I cannot help thinking that the influence of Bismarck in German politics was more wholesome than is that of Mr. John Temple Graves. For eloquence, per se, considered merely as an art of pleasing, I entertain something of the respect evoked by success, for it always pleases at least the speaker. It is to speech what an ornate style is to writing, good and pleasant enough in its time and place, and, like pie crust, and the evening girl destitute of any basis in common sense. Forensic eloquence, on the contrary, has an all too sufficient foundation in reason and the order of things. It promotes the ambition of tricksters and advances the fortunes of rogues. For I take it that the Ciceros, the Maribos, the Burks, the O'Connells, the Patrick Henrys, and the rest of them pets of the textbookers and scourges of youth belong in either the one category or the other, or in both. Anyhow, I find it impossible to think of them as high-minded men and right forth statesmen with their actors' tricks, their devices of the countenance, inventions of gesture, and other cunning expedients having nothing to do with the matter in hand. Extinction of the orator I hold to be the most beneficent possibility of evolution. If Mr. Goss has done anything to retard that blessed time when the Burke Cochrans shall cease from troubling and the airy be at rest, he is an enemy of his race. What? exclaims the thoughtless reader. I have but one. Are not the greatest forensic speeches by the world's famous orators good reading? Considering them merely as literature, do you not derive a high and refining pleasure from them? I do not. I find them turgid and tumid, no end. They are bad reading, though they may have been good hearing. In order to enjoy them, one must have in memory what, indeed, one is seldom permitted to forget, that they were addressed to the ear. And in imagination, one must hold some shadowy simulacrum of the orator himself uttering his work. These conditions being fulfilled, there remains for application to the matter of the discourse too little attention to get much good of it, and the total effect is confusion. Literature by which the reader is compelled to bear in mind the producer and the circumstances under which it was produced can be spared. Natura benigna. It is not always on remote islands peopled with pagans that great disasters occur, as memory witnesseth. Nor are the forces of nature inadequate 
to production of a fiercer throw than any that we have known. The situation is this. We are tied by the feet to a fragile shell imperfectly confining a force powerful enough under favoring conditions to burst it asunder and set the fragments wallowing and grinding together in liquid flame in the blind fury of a readjustment. Nay, it needs no such stupendous cataclysm to depeople this uneasy orb. Let but a square mile be blown out of the bottom of the sea, or a great rift open there. Is it to be supposed that we would be unaffected in the altered conditions generated by a contest between the ocean and the Earth's molten core? These fatalities are not only possible, but in the highest degree probable. It is probable, indeed, that they have occurred over and over again, effacing all the more highly organized forms of life and compelling the slow march of the evolution to begin anew. Slow? On the stage of eternity, the passing of races, the entrances and exits of life, are incidents in a brisk and lively drama, following one another with confusing rapidity. Mankind has not found it practicable to abandon and avoid those places where the forces of nature have been most malign. The track of the western tornado is speedily repeopled. San Francisco is still populous, despite its earthquake. Galveston, despite its storm, and even the courts of Lisbon are not kept by the lion and the lizard. In the Peruvian village straight downward into whose streets the crew of a United States warship once looked from the crest of a wave that stranded her a half mile inland, are heard the tinkle of the guitar and the voices of children at play. There are people living at Herculaneum and Pompeii. On the slopes about Catania, the goat herd endures with what courage he may, the trembling of the ground beneath his feet, as old Enceladus again turns over on his other side. As the Hoang Ho goes back inside its banks after fertilizing its contiguity with hydrate of Chinaman, the living agriculturalist follows the receding wave, sets up his habitation beneath the broken embankment, and again the valley of the gone away blossoms as the rose, its people diving with death. This matter cannot be amended. The race exposes itself to peril because it can do no otherwise. In all the world there is no city of refuge, no temple in which to take sanctuary, clinging to the horns of the altar, no place apart, where, like hunted deer, we can hope to elude the baying pack of nature's malevolences. The deadline is drawn at the gate of life. Man crosses it at birth. His advent is a challenge to the entire pack. Earthquake, storm, fire, flood, drought, heat, cold, wild beasts, venomous reptiles, noxious insects, bacilli, spectacular plague, and velvet-footed household disease are all fierce and tireless in pursuit. Dodge, turn, and double. How he can. There's no eluding them. Soon or late, some of them have him by the throat, and his spirit returns to the God who gave it and gave them. We are told that this earth was made for our inhabiting, our dearly beloved brethren in the faith, our spiritual guides, philosophers, and friends of the pulpit. Never tire of pointing out the goodness of God in giving us so excellent a place to live in and commending the admirable adaptation of all things to our needs. What a fine world it is, to be sure, a darling little world, so suited to the needs of man. A globe of liquid fire straining within the shell relatively no thicker than that of an egg, a shell constantly cracking and in momentary danger of going all to pieces. Three-fourths of this delectable field of human activity are covered with an element in which we cannot breathe, and which swallows us by myriads. With moldering bones the deep is white, from the frozen zones to the tropic bright. Of the other one-fourth, more than one-half is uninhabitable by reason of climate. On the remaining one-eighth, 
we pass a comfortless and precarious existence in disputed occupancy with countless ministers of death and pain. Pass it in fighting for it, tooth and nail, a hopeless battle in which we are foredoomed to defeat. Everywhere death, terror, lamentation, and the laughter that is more terrible than tears, the fury and despair of a race hanging on to life by the tips of its fingers. And the prize for which we strive to have and to hold, what is it? A thing that is neither enjoyed while had or missed when lost. So worthless it is, so unsatisfying, so inadequate to purpose, so false to hope, and at its best so brief, that for consolation and compensation we set up fantastic faiths of an aftertime in a better world from which no confirming whisper has ever reached us across the void. Heaven is a prophecy uttered by the lips of despair, but hell is an inference from analogy. The Death Penalty 1. Down with the gallows is a cry not unfamiliar in America. There is always a movement afoot to make odious the just principle of a life for a life to represent it as a relic of barbarism, a usurpation of the divine authority, and the rest of it. The lawmaking murder punishable by death is as purely a measure of self-defense as is the display of a pistol to one diligently endeavoring to kill without provocation. It is in precisely the same sense an admonition, a warning to abstain from crime, Society says by that law, if you kill one of us, you die. Just as by display of the pistol, the individual whose life is attacked says, desist or be shot. To be effective, the warning in either case must be more than an idle threat. Even the most unearthly reasoner among the anti-hanging unfortunates would hardly expect to frighten away an assassin who knew the pistol to be unloaded. Of course, these queer illogicians cannot be made to understand that their position commits them to absolute non-resistance to any kind of aggression. And that is fortunate for the rest of us. For if as Christians they frankly and consistently took that ground, we should be under the miserable necessity of respecting them. We have good reason to hold that the horrible prevalence of murder in this country is due to the fact that we do not execute our laws, that the death penalty is threatened but not inflicted, that the pistol is not loaded. In civilized countries, where there is enough respect for the laws to administer them, there is enough to obey them. While man still has as much of the ancestral brute as his skin can hold without cracking, we shall have thieves and demagogues and anarchists and assassins and persons with a private system of lexicography who define murder as disease and hanging as murder. But in all this welter of crime and stupidity are areas where human life is comparatively secure against the human hand. It is at least a significant coincidence that in these the death penalty for murder is fairly well enforced by judges who do not derive any part of their authority from those for whose restraint and punishment they hold it. Against the life of one guiltless person, the lives of 10,000 murderers count for nothing. Their hanging is a public good, without reference to the crimes that disclose their deserts. If we could discover them by other signs than their bloody deeds, they should be hanged anyhow. Unfortunately, we must have a death as evidence. The scientist who will tell us how to recognize the potential assassin and persuade us to kill him will be the greatest benefactor of his century. What would these enemies of the gibbet have, these lineal descendants of the drunken mobs that hooted the hangman at Tyburn Tree, this progeny of criminals? which has so defiled with the mud of its animosity the noble office of public executioner that even in this enlightened age he shirks his high duty, entrusting it to a hidden or unnamed subordinate. If murder is unjust, of what importance is it whether its punishment by death 
be just or not. Nobody needs to incur it. Men are not drafted for the death penalty. They volunteer. Then it is not deterrent, mutters the gentleman whose rude forefather hooted the hangman. Well, as to that, the law which is to accomplish more than a part of its purpose must be awaited with great patience. Every murder proves that hanging is not altogether deterrent. Every hanging, that it is somewhat deterrent, it deters the person hanged. A man's first murder is his crime. His second is ours. The socialist, it seems, believe with Alphonse Carr in the expediency of abolishing the death penalty, but apparently they do not hold with him that the assassins should begin. They want the state to begin. Believing that the magnanimous example will effect a change of heart in those about to murder. This, I take it, is the meaning of their assertion that death penalties have not the deterring influence that imprisonment for life carries. In this, they obviously err. Death deters at least the person who suffers it. He commits no more murder. Whereas the assassin, who is imprisoned for life and immune from further punishment, may with impunity kill his keeper or whomsoever he may be able to get at. Even as matters now are, incessant vigilance is required to prevent convicts in prison from murdering their attendants and one another. How would it be if the life-termer were assured against any additional inconvenience for braining a guard occasionally or strangling a chaplain now and then? A penitentiary may be described as a place of punishment and reward, and under the system proposed, the difference in desirableness between a sentence and an appointment would be virtually effaced. To overcome this objection, a life sentence would have to mean solitary confinement, and that means insanity. Is that what these gentlemen propose to substitute for death? The death penalty, say these amiables and feudalarians, creates bloodthirstiness in the unthinking masses and defeats its own ends, is itself a cause of murder, not a check. These gentlemen are themselves of the unthinking masses. They do not know how to think. Let them try to trace and lucidly expound the chain of motives lying between the knowledge that a murderer has been hanged and the wish to commit a murder. How, precisely, does the one beget the other? By what unearthly process of reasoning does a man turning away from the gallows persuade himself that it is expedient to incur the danger of hanging? Let us have pointed out to us the several steps in that remarkable mental progress. Obviously, the thing is absurd. One might as reasonably say that contemplation of a pitted face will make a man wish to go and catch smallpox, or the spectacle of an amputated limb on the scrap heap of a hospital tempt him to cut off his arm or renounce his leg. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, say the opponents of the death penalty, is not justice. It is revenge and unworthy of a Christian civilization. It is exact justice. Nobody can think of anything more accurately just than such punishments would be. Whatever the motive in awarding them, unfortunately, such a system is not practicable. But he who denies its justice must deny also the justice of a bushel of corn for a bushel of corn, a dollar for a dollar, service for service. We cannot undertake by such clumsy means as laws and courts to do the criminal exactly what he has done to his victim. But to demand a life for a life is simple, practicable, expedient, and therefore right. Taking the life of a murderer does not restore the life he took. Therefore, it is a most illogical punishment. Two wrongs do not make a right. Here's richness. Hanging an assassin is illogical because it does not restore the life of his victim. Incarceration is logical. Therefore, incarceration does quod erat demonstrandum. Two wrongs certainly do not make a right.
But the veritable thing in dispute is whether taking the life of a life taker is a wrong. So naked and unashamed an example of petitio principii would disgrace a debater in a pinafore. And these wonder mongers have the effrontery to babble of logic. Why, if one of them were to meet a syllogism in a lonely road, he would run away in a hundred and fifty directions as hard as ever he could hoof it. One is almost ashamed to dispute with such intellectual cloutlings. Whatever an individual may rightly do to protect himself, society may rightly do to protect him. For he is a part of itself. If he may rightly take life in defending himself, society may rightly take life in defending him. If society may rightly take life in defending him, it may rightly threaten to take it. Having rightly and mercifully threatened to take it, it is not only rightly may take it, but expediently must. The law of a life for a life does not altogether prevent murder. No law can altogether prevent any form of crime, nor is it desirable that it should. Doubtless God could have created us that our sense of right and justice could have existed without contemplation of injustice and wrong, as doubtless he could so have created us that we could have felt compassion without a knowledge of suffering, but he did not. Constituted as we are, we can know good only by contrast with evil. Our sense of sin is what our virtues feed upon. In the thin air of universal morality, the altar fires of honor and the beacons of conscience could not be kept alight. A community without crime would be a community without warm and elevated sentiments, without the sense of justice, without generosity, without courage, without mercy, without magnanimity, a community of small, smug souls uninteresting to God and uncoveted by the devil. We can have and do have too much crime, no doubt. What the wholesome proportion is, none can tell. Just now we are running a good deal to murder, but he who can gravely attribute that phenomenon or any part of it to infliction of the death penalty instead of to virtual immunity from any penalty at all is justly entitled to the innocent satisfaction that comes of being a simpleton. 3. The new woman is against the death penalty, naturally, for she is hot and hearty in the conviction that whatever is, is wrong. She has visited this world in order to straighten things out a bit and is in distress lest the number of things be insufficient to her need. The matter is important variously not least so in its relation to the new heaven and the new earth that are to be the outcome of woman suffrage. There can be no doubt that the vast majority of women have sentimental objections to the death penalty that quite outweigh such practical considerations in its favor as they can be persuaded to comprehend. Aided by the minority of men afflicted by the same mental malady, they will indubitably affect its abolition in the first lustrum of their political equality. The new woman will scarcely feel the seat of power warm beneath her before giving to the assassins, unhand me, villain, the authority of law. So we shall make the old experiment, discredited by a thousand failures, of preventing crime by tenderness to caught criminals. And the criminal uncaught will treat us to a quantity and quality of crime notably augmented by the Christian spirit of the new regime. 4. As to painless execution, the simple and practical way to make them both just and expedient is the adoption by murderers of a system of painless assassinations. Until this is done, there seems to be no call to renounce the wholesome discomfort of the style of executions endeared to us by memories and associations of the tenderest character. There is, I fancy, a shaping notion in the observant mind that the penologists 
and their allies have gone about as far as they can safely be permitted to go in the direction of a softer suasion of the criminal nature toward good behavior. The modern prison has become a rather more comfortable habitation than the dangerous classes that are accustomed to at home. Modern prison life has in their eyes something of the charm and glamour of an ideal existence, like that in the happy valley from which Rosellus had the folly to escape. Whatever advantages to the public may be secured by abating the rigors of imprisonment and inconveniences incident to execution, there is this objection. It makes them less deterrent. Let the penologers and the philanthropers have their way, and even hanging might be made so pleasant and withal so interesting a social distinction that it would deter nobody but the person hanged. Adopt the euthanasian method of electricity, asphyxia by smothering in rose leaves, or slow poisoning with rich food, and the death penalty may come to be regarded as the object of a noble ambition to the bon vivant. And the rising young suicide may go and kill somebody else instead of himself in order to receive from the public executioner a happier dispatch than his own prentice hand can assure him. But the advocates of agreeable pains and penalties tell us that in the darker ages when cruel and degrading punishment was the rule and was freely inflicted for every light infraction of the law, crime was more common than it is now. And in this they appear to be right. But one and all, they overlook a fact equally obvious and vastly significant, that the intellectual, moral, and social condition of the masses was very low. Crime was more common because ignorance was more common. Poverty was more common. Sins of authority, and therefore hatred of authority, were more common. The world of even a century ago was a different world from the world of today, and a vastly more uncomfortable one. The popular adage to the contrary notwithstanding, human nature was not by a long cut the same then that it is now. In the very ancient time of that early English king, King George III, when women were burned at the stake in public for various offenses and men were hanged for coining, and children for theft, and in the still remoter period, circa 1530, when prisoners were boiled in several waters, diverse sorts of criminals were disemboweled, and some are thought to have undergone the pen forte dure of cold pressing, an infliction which the pen of Hugo has since made popular in literature. In these wicked old days, crime flourished, not because of the law's severity, but in spite of it. It is possible that our lawmaking ancestors understood the situation as it then was a trifle better than we can understand it on the hither side of this gulf of years, and that they were not the reasonless barbarians that we think them to have been. And if they were, what must have been the unreason and barbarity of the criminal element with which they had to deal? I am far from thinking that severity of punishment can have the same restraining effect as probability of some punishment being inflicted. But if mildness of penalty is to be superadded to difficulty of conviction, and both are to be mounted upon laxity in detection, the pile will be complete indeed. There is a peculiar fitness, perhaps, in the fact that all these pleas for comfortable punishment should be urged at a time when there appears to be a general disposition to inflict no punishment at all. There are, however, still a few old-fashioned persons who hold it obvious that one who is ambitious to break the laws of his country will not with so light a heart and so airy an indifference incur the peril of a harsh penalty as he will the chance of one more nearly resembling that which he would himself select. 5. After lying for more than a century dead, I was revived, dowered with a new body and restored to society. The first thing of interest that I observed was an enormous building, 
covering a square mile of ground. It was surrounded on all sides by a high, strong wall of hewn stone upon which armed sentinels paced to and fro. In one face of the wall was a single gate of massive iron strongly guarded. While admiring the Cyclopean architecture of the Reverend Pyle, I was accosted by a man in uniform, evidently the warden, with a cheerful salutation. Colonel, I said, pray tell me what is this building? This, said he, is the new state penitentiary. It is one of twelve, all alike. You surprise me, I replied. Surely the criminal element must have increased enormously. Yes, indeed, he assented. Under the reform regime, which began in your day, crime became so powerful, bold, and fierce that arrests were no longer possible, and the prisons then in existence were soon overcrowded. The state was compelled to erect others of greater capacity. But, Colonel, I protested, if the criminals were too bold and powerful to be taken into custody, of what use are the prisons? And how are they crowded? He fixed upon me a look that I could not fail to interpret as expressing a doubt of my sanity. What? he said. Is it possible that the modern penology is unknown to you? Do you suppose we practice the antiquated and ineffective method of shutting up the rascals? Sir, the growth of the criminal element has, as I said, compelled the erection of more and larger prisons. We have enough to hold comfortably all the honest men and women of the state. Within these protecting walls, they carry on all the necessary vocations of life, excepting commerce. That is necessarily in the hands of the rogues, as before. Venerated representative of reform, I exclaimed, wringing his hand with effusion. You are knowledge, you are history, you are the higher education. We must talk further. Come, let us enter this benign edifice. You shall show me your dominion and instruct me in the rules. You shall propose me as an inmate. I walked rapidly to the gate. When challenged by the sentinel, I turned to summon my instructor. He was nowhere visible. I turned again to look at the prison. Nothing was there. Desolate and forbidding, as about the broken statue of Ozymandias, the lone and level sand stretched far away. End of section two.